All right, but I'm recording. All right, awesome. All right, what's going on, guys? So uh, I think I, if you guys didn't see me in the last uh, Zoom meeting that I did, so I kind of talked about uh, the formations of TAR and kind of the history of it. Um, but yeah, um, I guess uh, you guys brought me back to talk about a little bit of like sim and software development. So that was pretty cool, guys. And um, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about kind of the, uh, the software tools that we use or that we have used in the past and uh, some of the things that work kind of well. And hopefully you guys can figure out um, like what you guys want to continue to use uh, and what might be useful. Um, so I got a little bit of a presentation to start. I'm gonna kind of go over like some of the more high level stuff and then work down to like a, a demo at the end of the uh, presentation, which will hopefully be pretty cool. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. Oh, <laughs> that's funny. Went to the other screen. There we are. That's pretty. That's that was good. That like I had the second computer there because I like noticed that I messed up and I didn't just start talking. <laughs> All right. So, cool. So, so some of the, some of some of like the design philosophy and like the techniques that we're using at Tar is like pretty pretty unique uh, when you consider the uh, aerospace engineer the aerospace industry at, at large. Um, like the aerospace industry at large is like known for being like a big behemoth, like very uh, bureaucratic um, and like slow to adapt. Um, but you know that's starting to change, and it's and it's definitely it's definitely really interesting when you look at kind of the drone industry and like some of the startups that you see in the drone industry, um, which are more more akin to kind of uh, software companies. And it's been really cool because in the last like uh, 10, 15 years, um, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of aircraft development has become more and more software and you are actually able to like effectively bring a lot of like the software design, um, like techniques, like, uh, rapid, rapid iteration and, um, and like being able to test, uh, test a failure, at least in software. Whereas like with, um, traditional aerospace, like there would be a lot of, um, of design work and like proving that a system will work before you, before you do an all up test, which uh, takes a lot of time. So the other thing that we've, uh, that we've been really good at is uh, integrating, taking and integrating open source packages and uh, kind of innovating at a system level, which is more of like a, uh, a traditional aerospace approach is like um, you, you want to, you want, you want to innovate on the systems of systems and put and like evaluate, Oh, what does this manufacturer have versus this manufacturer and like build your expertise around, uh, joining a, a bunch of different systems. Um, and so like, I, I've like started to kind of coin the term, uh, innovation from adjacency and like th what that, what that means to me is basically like, you want to look at, um, industries that have a lot of expertise, in one field um, and from that try to take what they're using and apply it to uh, your field and kind of um, take the cutting edge of each of the adjacent fields around drones so like the best of like computer vision the best of simulation the best of of like different hardware products and then you put them together so it's it, that's what I, that's why I call innovation from adjacency um, and yeah I think I touched on the last bullet there. So um, open source development. So this has kind of been our bread and butter is kind of just taking or looking around on the internet and finding different uh, open source pro projects that are in adjacent fields and that have already kind of been developed for us. That way we're not starting from ground zero and then evaluating them, trying to figure out how much, how much work it's gonna to be to actually integrate that into a system and uh, trying to inter and trying to figure out like is this actually um, the best approach the um, to solve our problem? And the cool thing is that it's usually it's you you can usually pretty quickly evaluate a bunch of different 
are multiple open source projects. Whereas like, if you were going like the more traditional route, you would kind of, uh, you would be a lot more limited in the things that you could try um, in a system. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, the other thing that you'll notice is that like a lot of these uh, open source projects, um, some of them, some of them lack maturity and like some of them are actually surprisingly really good. Um, but yeah, there's some definitely some techniques that you can do to, to select and uh, weed out some of the weaker packages. So, and then the last, the last little bit is like, yeah, so you'll take, you'll take a, a project that was originally designed for one use case and then uh, you'll typically have to do a little bit of development work on top of that package to integrate it into your system of systems. And uh, like that, that is kind of, uh, that's where I've kind of like, where like when I was running TAR, like that was kind of like what I was trying to focus on was, you know, building the pipes to put all these together. Um, yeah, so I had a couple of recommendations for integrating open source packages. Um, so the first thing is typically open source packages that have a large community, a large user base are going to be a lot more robust and give you a lot less headache. And that's kind of because there's so many people using it that a lot of the bugs that are harder to find when it's just one developer pop up. And then in addition to that, there's a, a higher chance that, um, that somebody is going to be willing and able to fix that bug, right? So over time, like these uh, these large these open source packages that have large communities end up becoming pretty robust, which is which is good. And like you kind of want to look for those. So an example of that would be like RD Pilot. Like there's literally hundreds, if not thousands, of developers on RD Pilot and thousands of users. And so all those forces put together uh, end up. Um, working through the bugs and it's actually a pretty robust uh, project in my opinion. Um, the next thing is uh, to definitely look at the GitHub issues tab when you start running into projects or problems with these open source uh, packages. And if, uh, if it's breaking because like maybe a dependency has been updated and that's now breaking the package, like definitely look for merge requests or for forks that are, that have like, branches that are named with the kind of dependency because those are typically people that are going through and uh, trying to do the update and trying to get it to work. And a lot of times uh, you can get what you want by kind of like going down that route. So I wanted to do a little example of like something that I ran into when I was, when I was kind of upgrading my system to, uh, to the new Ubuntu 2004. Uh, I was looking at Darknet ROS, which Darknet is the neural net framework for YOLO, which YOLO was our neural net like image detector that we were using for mission seven. So I wanted to use this project again because I really like it. And I noticed that it was no longer building on 2004. So then I basically came to the, the GitHub issues side of, of Darknet Ross and I erased the uh, is open part. I went um, open CV4 and I type that in. Uh, I spelt it right the first the uh, when I did this the other time. Open CV4, and then I found all these issues. Like, oh, there's a bunch of other people running into this uh, problem, and I ended up like kind of reading through this one. And I think the one that I clicked on was this one, and I kind of came down here, and um, I basically found that one of these guys had a pull request. Yeah, this guy, he was like, hey, you should try this one. So then I came over here and I looked at his pull request and I realized that it's coming from this repo. So then I clicked on his repo and cloned it, checked out the branch with the feature that I needed and it worked. So a lot of times like uh, big, big issues that are causing um, software to not build, you can kind of like find a solution in this route. <clears throat> okay, so let's go back to the presentation. Oops, no. So yeah, I just want you guys to keep that in mind. So, so I like threw this in because uh, 
because I thought this was like a really interesting way of like thinking of, uh, of development in general. And uh, I actually got this idea from uh, a podcast that I was watching yesterday. Uh, it was basically Lex Friedman was uh, inter- interviewing like the guy who's come out with all the, the Wolfram uh, products like, uh, like Mathematica and Wolfram Alpha. And uh, what he was using like this concept of multigraphs for was uh, kind of mapping out like um, discoveries in mathematics and then realizing that other parts of mathematics are, have equivalencies and that's like where the, the paths join. And that's kind of the, the same idea with, uh, with development. Um, like maybe you, you'll go down this idea and then you have to like do this other step to develop a, um, a, a feature and then this feature, which le- leads to this, which is like, this is the end, out, the, uh, end output. Uh, but maybe there is like a quicker route and like this would have only taken two steps, whereas like this took 10 steps. Um, let me back up a sec because the original like kind of example was like there are infinite ways to get from zero to 10 by adding and subtracting. And so like one of the simple ways is like, oh, okay, just add five and then add another five. Then you get to 10 and it's only two steps. Whereas like you can add a bunch of different numbers and go this way or you can add subtract and go this way. And like, um, basically what, what I was trying to say is like, you kind of want to find the quickest routes to, to your success point. And I don't know, I just thought this kind of interesting concept. I also kind of like graph this on, uh, some of the features that we were developing for mission seven. So ended up making a multi, a multi-way like kind of graph of like the things that, that like we were discovering. So, you know, we kind of, so when we were developing our computer vision to detect the Roombas, and then we also wanted to do some computer vision to like uh, give an estimate of our position um, in the, in, in the arena. And so, you know, we kind of started off by in MATLAB kind of using some of the computer vision fish, uh, features and then writing our own like, image processing features in MATLAB. And then we learned this and then we realized, oh, um, like this wasn't gonna be very easy to deploy to the drone. So then we like switched to OpenCV and then uh, kind of like went down some of these paths. I think the other thing that's kind of interesting about these these multi-way graphs is like, you can kind of see um, like if you were to get to here, like you could take this path and like you are, since you had already like discovered it from going around this path, you know, it only, it would only take a little bit more effort to get this to full deployment. Um, yeah. I don't know. That was kind of just a, a side rant. We can talk about that if you guys have questions later or just interested in talking about that. I thought that was just interesting. So here's... I, was gonna say, I think it's really a good way to introduce people into like how you got to where you are now with your software. Cause like there's so many ways to do it wrong. That there's like, also a lot of ways to do it right too. Exactly. exactly. And there's not, there's not one path either, which is interesting. And some of the paths are longer and like, I kind of like the node representation cause like the number of nodes are kind of like it, it I and mean, it's not a perfect representation, but it could be used in a way to kind of evaluate um, how much effort it would be to develop a feature. Yeah. But yeah, I'd love to explore that a little bit more. I thought that was really cool. Um, yeah. So here's like a kind of a software over overview, overview of like all the, of like how our drone worked for mission eight, I believe. And, uh, so we have, uh, we had two different computers on our drone. We had the, the Pixhawk, which, we kind of, um, we, we use for like lower level control. Um, and it had like the IMU and the EKF and optical flow sensor, and then uh, did some stability control and then like uh, outputted commands to the motors. And then on top of that, we kind of use the, the Jetson 2 to make higher level decisions and to, to do guidance for our, for our aircraft. So we had, a, we had a stereo camera, which was being used as a sensor to go into the uh, the mapping and um, localization package orb slam, and then we were um, 
we were basically taking the output of the position from orb slam to give another estimate to our EKF uh, over here, which was then further refining our position estimate for our aircraft. And um, on the TX2, basically all these lines are basically connections using ROS, which I don't know if you guys have like really talked about um, ROS and how that's used, but the simple way to think of ROS is it's a, it's a communication, it's a way to define um, input inputs and outputs of a, uh, of a certain program such that you, you can um, get a bunch of programs to collaborate and like network together. So you'll be able to take like a stereo camera and publish an image to, uh, to a common interface on, on the orb slam like node, which is a different program than what is uh, talking to the camera. And then those programs can talk to each other. So it makes it, it makes your, um, it makes your, uh, robot modular such that you can interchange um, different um, pieces of software. Hey Eric, there's a few questions in chat. If can you look oh, at that? Shoot. Quick? Yeah, I didn't. Uh, I wasn't noticing that. That was interesting. That'd be cool. Okay, yeah. Let's go back to the EKF. Not bad. Okay, so the EKF is basically. Um, an extended, it stands for extended common filter. And the way to think of that is it's, it's fusing, it's fusing estimates from a bunch of different uh, sources uh, or a bunch of different sensors to get a better estimate of your accelerations, your velocities and your, uh, your position. And uh, you know, the more, the more data that you have, a lot of times that'll lead to a better estimate of, uh, of where your drone is and make it more controllable. So yeah, that's a that's a good uh, that's a the next one is a really good question. So the Pixhawk is actually a computer, and then the Jetson's a different computer, um, and uh, yeah. So then on on the Jetson, that's where we are running Ross. It's a uh, that that is a inner process communication. So how the different pieces of software with, within the one computer uh, talk to each other. That's over Ross. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not familiar with a uh, computer language interpreter. Um, I, think, I think you would compare Ross to, to like, it's, it's, it's probably built on UDP uh, messages if you're familiar with that. It's um, it's a way to like generate uh, message structures for basically IP communication. Mm, I'm not really sure. Um, On that, is there, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Umer. Um, yeah. So everything in ROS is actually just C plus plus or Python, um, and so ROS is just is handling the. Uh, like the communication between, um, yeah, the different program modules. So you could have like a computer vision one, you can have a controls one, and then that way they're independent, but they can still communicate with each other in an easy way. Yeah, and it's essentially an IP-based uh, communication protocol. <laughs> Slack for, for programs. <laughs> That's interesting. But uh, just to clarify a little further, the Pixhawk and the Jetson are physical computers that we put on the drone. Like if you look at pictures of our drone, there is a little black rectangle and that is the Pixhawk. And that's where all the motors and the um, flight radio um, are plugged in. And then there's the Jetson, which is a little silver box. And that is a computer that we run like our um, computer vision software on. So those are two distinct computers. I don't know if y'all have heard of Raspberry Pi, but a Jetson is essentially uh, a Raspberry Pi, which is like this really small, um, small computer. I have one right here, actually. But it's basically just a computer. Uh, and the Jetson is a really like high powered one that has, uh, is really good at like image processing. So that's the reason why we use that. And it's small and easy to uh, put on a drone. Yeah. Exactly. Like the Jetson has a ton of compute power 
um, and specifically has a graphics processing unit, a GPU, which uh, allows you to do a lot of parallelization when you're doing image processing. So that's pretty cool. Okay, dope. I'm gonna hit the last little bits here. So this is a uh, this is kind of like so I've been thinking about your guys' predicament like with uh, with the whole uh, virus and the lockdown, uh, not being able to like meet in person. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a this is something that you guys could probably set up um, to allow a lot of uh, a lot of people who don't have the ability to either dual boot or um, don't have the uh, the specs in their machines to like run um, the full like simulation. So what you guys can do is probably use all the desktops that you guys have for tar that we've collected that are really good at running the simulation and then set up, uh, allow, allow SSH to these computers. And then basically um, through like uh, a cloud network, you could probably SSH in and then you could probably use gazebo web uh, which is which is which allows you to use gazebo but from like the web browser and that way it makes it um, OS independent and uh, then you will also be offloading a lot of the all the compute basically to the to the sim computer um, and then I think we would also probably want to put this on a, a virtual private network such that it was as if you guys were all on the same uh, network in the lab and then it also give you guys a little bit of a security isolation from the rest rest of the web i've also kind of talked about this with uh with umer and umer thinks like uh that you guys could probably just give all of these guys a uh, static public public ip addresses then you wouldn't need the vpn so it might be a little easier to set up um but i don't know if i'm in favor of that so that would be uh that'll be something you guys need to decide we're we're kind of working on it right now we just had we just got permission to set up computers in the lab with uh, with like Ethernet and everything. So we have a computer set up on the second floor lab. And one of our members, I don't think Cameron's here right now, but he's going to go in this next week. I'm probably going to go with him to to try and get at least one setup to make sure that works. But we want like full desktop access. And I, does Gazebo Web give you desktop access or is that just to Gazebo? Uh, yeah, it's just for Gazebo. But I also have a demo that has like a couple – That'll, that'll be featuring like a couple of um, web tools that'll also be um, be helpful. Like if you can also uh, forward the uh, the graphics from the desktop, that would also be helpful. Um, but and, and you could do both, and you could try uh, and see like which is which is better for different for different setups and different people. Yeah, it just it might be tough uh, for new members running everything through terminal, like a, a full desktop and like graphics would be probably easier to just manage and deal with yeah but ultimately like you're still going to be running your programs through the terminal um right. like when you when you build a ROS or a ross uh program you're going to end up executing it through the terminal so it's yeah. almost there's there's almost no difference between like sshing in and then forwarding the graphics to the terminal in um or i mean doing what you said where you log in and you see the graphics and then you make a terminal that's then being form forwarded via the graphics versus using uh, a terminal for your home OS and then SSHing in and then running the program. Right. So would you still be able to see all of the graphics from like, uh, like Arducopter, for example? So, I mean, Arducopter ultimately doesn't really have any graphics. Like, uh, I guess, I guess map proxy, like the map and the, uh, the console. So you would be able to, if you do an SSH dash X and then it would X forward, um, those, those, those things. And then in addition to that, I'm going to also show how you guys can, um, how you guys can install like Q ground control and then connect to a drone over a network here, uh, after I get done with this. Sounds good. Cool. Yeah. And then, uh, I think we can also have a, have a discussion about like what's, what's possible because this is also something that like, I'm just now exploring and I don't know how, I don't have all the answers either. So I was just going to show you guys, uh, what I've been thinking is possible. Do you know anything about uh, Amazon Web Services? Because that was also something we were talking about um, for cloud computing and stuff like that. Yeah, so I was looking at the AWS stuff for this too, because I was also thinking about that. And that would be, that's really interesting um, because you can essentially uh, get as many desktops as you want and then you would pay for 
you would pay for the desktops per usage. Um, and I think, I think that is something that is available for you guys and you guys could use it. But the first thing you want to do is all, you also want to make sure that you're utilizing the computers that you always, that you already have, because, uh, you'll basically, you basically already have, uh, I don't know how many computers you have, but you have at least that many, um, resources. And so if you use those, then you don't have to pay for those on AWS and you can ultimately do the same thing with AWS as, as, uh, what I'm suggesting here. So maybe you can do both. I've. I've used, uh, well, not AWS, I've used Google Cloud Platform and Microsoft Azure. So they're basically the same thing. And like, I wouldn't say it's any easier or harder than doing the like VPN SSH, like set up with our machines. And so I think it's just easier to use our own machines, especially like if we have an ethernet connection to them, then, you know, it's just, it just seems easier to yeah, I think I think leverage you guys probably start with the uh, with your own machines, and then yeah. if you guys have uh, if you guys start running out of resources, like many people are trying to use it at the same time, then maybe maybe augment that with AWS. Mm -hmm. But I don't see it running out of resources. Another thing though is, as students, we do get like some small amount of free credits for Google Cloud Platform, um, but yeah, it's not. I don't know it. It hasn't, it's not really worth it, I think, when we have the desktops available. Yeah. I also know that UT has its own VPN set up and integrated into the network. So we could also take advantage of that for security and stuff like that. That might be a better way to do it, actually. Yeah. That'd be really nice. It, wonder... The only question is like on that VPN, can you see all the other IPs that are on there? Because I'm not entirely sure. Um, I haven't fully investigated it yet, but I mean, maybe, I'm not sure. So I believe they get mad if you start scanning for IPs on there. Yeah. So if you started doing um, a scan or something, but I guess if yeah. you already know like what the IP is, oh, but DHCP might assign the, the server yeah. to a different IP. It's worth playing around with. Yeah. It would be worth playing around with. I mean, I also don't think it would be too hard to set up, uh, your own VPN. Like you just need a computer with a static or with a public, a static public IP address. And then you could probably use like open, open VPN or something like that. There's probably some network admin we could talk to that would help us. Well, that up. I, I kind of want to avoid saying that cause they're just going to go with the default. No. And then you gotta like work around what they require on it. Whereas if you just like do it, then like odds are they won't, you know, notice. Yeah. Uh, and if they I'll do, then you're just like, oh, yeah, is there a better way? Otherwise, you're just going to be stuck in, like, figuring out what's allowed by UT for a year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's something that we've noticed. And we've kind of always, like, skirted, like, what what is considered okay with, with the lab machines. Because we've talked to the network admin, and he kind of didn't really – he really didn't enjoy that we were using one uh, one user per computer and not having everybody on a separate user account. Yeah, but, there's that. Yeah. And then, I mean, he also wasn't too fond of us, like, getting our own computers in yeah, the first place. Yeah, building our own computer. Yeah, yeah, he wanted us to, like, uh, get a pre-bought computer. Um, but, or like, we just went ahead and did it. And, like, he's like, well, now that you have it, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes you just got to show up with the things and then, like, okay, fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't really know. That's actually I, just a... I feel like the building the computer was like really not a big deal, but you know, whatever. <laughs> All right, cool. So now I'm gonna do a little demo of uh, gazebo and stuff. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but so if it's completely new, that's cool. Uh, if not, then maybe I'll just show off like a couple features I guess I haven't seen before. So that'd be pretty cool. All right, so. Uh, actually, let me relaunch all this just to show you guys what I'm doing here. Okay, dope. So, yeah, wait for it to die. One sec. Okay, dokie. So, I'm going to launch um, a gazebo world that I set up 
um, for one of my YouTube tutorials. So you guys can definitely clone the IQ Sim and IQ GNC packages and you guys can see all the code that I'm gonna run in this demo. And there's also YouTube tutorials that I'll kind of show you guys uh, a lot of these different concepts. So I'm just gonna launch that. All right, so when I run that, I basically get a simulator with a, with a drone and a camera. And then um, I also have a bash script that basically launches uh, RD Pilot. And it ends up just running this command, which uh, you guys can check out on my GitHub or other resources. And so basically what this, what the, what I just ran there is actually the software that gets compiled and loaded onto the Pixhawk. And this is the software that talks to like the IMU and uh, other sensors um, that are on the aircraft. And um, also what I'm using here is called Mav Proxy, which is basically just like a stripped down uh, ground control station. Um, so this is like a way for you to like give commands to the, uh, to the aircraft. Um, so yeah, I think the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of show you guys some of the commands in, uh, in map proxy. So one thing to take note here is, um, it took us a little while, especially when we had slower computers, like this, this IMU zero is using GPS and IMU one is using GPS it would take a little while to like pop up a lot of times on our slow computers. So if you don't have, if you don't have the, if you don't have it saying that it's using GPS, it doesn't have 3D fix and then you won't be able to take off um, in, a, in a guided mode in a, in a mode which like you can give positions cause it doesn't have, it doesn't like know where it is, it is yet. So if you put it in, uh, guided mode, um, you can then like issue uh, a takeoff command. So you can be like um, arm throttle and then, so you can get the, like the aircraft to like take off and stuff. And uh, it's kind of, uh, there's like some other commands you can do. Like uh, you can get the drone to move around. So you can be like, go to position and uh, give it like a 10, zero, zero. And this is like in the NED um, reference frame. So that'd be uh, your XS, your X axis is, is, is um, pointing out the front of the aircraft and your Y axis is pointing out the side, the right side of the aircraft. And then your Z axis is pointing down. So if you wanna go up, you actually gotta give it a negative number. Um, so yeah, th this is useful um, when you're kind of like debugging your programs and like you, uh, you might be like testing like a vision system. You're like, oh, okay, let me, let me just like move it over here a little bit and, uh, and see if I can see this one thing or whatnot. Um, the next thing that I'm going to kind of show off is Mavros. Um, so Mavros is basically a, um, it's a framework for communicating from your compa your companion computer, which is the Jetson, to your flight control computer, which is the uh, um, Pixhawk. And uh, what it is is it's it's taking a communication call protocol called Mavlink, which is like a really stripped down, like low latency protocol, and then it's and then it's taking all that data and throwing it into ROS, which is like uh, an easier environment for networking on on uh, the same computer. So um, next thing I'm gonna show is like kind of uh, some commands that you can use to, uh, to like see what's going on in your ROS environment. So the first one that you want, I wanna show is like ROS topic list, which will show you guys all the different uh, topics um, that you can get information from. So let's run that. 
So we can kind of take a look at all the different communication that's going on in our, uh, on our uh, machine right now. So there's all these uh, Mavlink uh, topics, which is like, this is, the, uh, this is the data that's coming from your, from your drone. So, you know, we have, uh, we have stuff like uh, local position, velocity, pose, um, odometry. Uh, we, have, we have stuff from the IMU. We have the temperature of the IMU, the temperature of the barometer, static pressure. And uh, so this is pretty cool because we can basically take this data that's on these topics and like kind of use it in our own programs. Um, so now to see like what kind of data is being, um, being published, you can use uh, the command line tool Ross Topic Echo. So if I want to see like what the state of the drone is, I can do a uh, Ross uh, Topic Echo and then just put the topic of the drone and uh, we'll end up seeing data here. And so what we're, what we're seeing here is basically like we're getting a timestamp of when this, uh, this data was sent from our drone and then we're getting a couple other um, pieces of information about um, the communication and the state of the drone. So it's like, is, are we connected to the drone? So is Mavros talking to the drone right now? That's true. Is the drone armed? That's true. Is it in guided mode? That's true. And then uh, it also has a, it also tells you what mode in a, in a string form. So like if I were to change this to mode land, so the, uh, the state should then go to land. I believe you misspelled land. Oh, hello. Oh, mode land, I believe. Ah, there we go. So then it changes to land. Thanks for catching that, Archer, because I was confused af for a sec. <laughs> okay. Um, so the next little bit is I want to show, I want to show off like some of the networking features. And then I also want to show off, um, like how you can test computer vision, um, and how you can use computer vision in like a, uh, in a large program. So ultimately by the end of this demo, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run a mission where we have the drone take off and then we're going to have it, um, basically fly, um, fly a search pattern and it's going to be looking for a person. And then once it finds a person, it's going to land. And basically what this is demonstrating is like, this is like a search and rescue program where like the drone might have like a, uh, some first aid and it's like looking for like maybe a hiker that's like injured in the forest and you know, you need to, you need to go and like give them some supplies or something like that. It's not, it's not like a perfect scenario, but you know, it's, it's a cool scenario, I guess. Um, so now I'm going to kind of, I'm going to use my laptop to kind of show um, how how we can do development on a on a server based uh, system. So let me start sharing my laptop screen. Okay, guys, you guys can see uh, my laptop screen, right? Archer? Good? Okay, cool. Yes, we're good. All right. All right, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to SSH into my computer, which I'm actually already SSH in, so I'll go ahead and exit. So I made a little script to like help me SSH a little bit and basically I can run this command, which is, uh, which is basically, um, my user and then my IP address. That's just, um, how I can get into my computer, my desktop computer. So now I basically went from my laptop to my desktop computer and I'm actually controlling a terminal on my desktop computer. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to GZ web, which is basically a, um, 
uh, a program that forwards like the visuals of Gazebo to uh, a website. So I'll just go there and then do a npm start. Oh wait, npm, my bad. And now if I go to the IP address of my host computer and then eight, port 8080, I will start to see the visuals of what's going on there. So we can get that a second to load. But yeah, so now I see, uh, I see my, my drone over here and um, basically most of the graphics is basically being offloaded to my desktop, which has a lot more compute than my laptop. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go back to my desktop and just like kill the RD pilot program. Um, that way I can take that over on my laptop real quick. Whoa. Okay, so I killed the RD pilot over there. So I'm already SSH, all these terminals are actually already, already SSH into my uh, desktop because I like practice this demo a little bit before you guys. So I'm gonna run my RD pilot script. And basically now the, uh, the flight software is like booting up uh, for the drone. So I'm gonna give that a second. And then uh, I'm gonna now go ahead and run Mavros again. And then I can come over here and take a look at what's going on on my ROS network. So we can see all the same uh, Mavros topics that we were looking at before. And then uh, come back to the, uh, the terminal again, check out if it's ready and the is using GPS just popped up. So now we can take off. So go mode guided. And then when we come back to the browser, we should see the, the drone start to take off, which is pretty cool. So a, uh, another like web, web application that I found the other day, which I thought was pretty cool, was this uh, web application that basically forwards, it, forwards all, the, um, all the image streams that are going on in your ROS network to uh, a website. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys that as well. It's called a uh, web video server. Oops. I got to give it a different port as the GZ server. <laughs> so uh, now basically like if I go to the website, which is the IP address of my desktop and then the port number that that website is being broadcasted on, which is 5,000, then I should be able to see like a list of all the, all the image streams which is now just the image stream from the webcam. So if I want to take a look at what's going on in the webcam, I can just uh, check this. And then now we can see the, what's going on from the perspective of the webcam. So if I start flying the drone around, uh, we should see a different perspective as it moves around. So. And then if I want to see the whole scene, come back here. And I notice that the drone flew over here now. So that's pretty cool. Um, so the next thing I'm going to show is uh, using the simulation to test um, to test uh, vision. So I'm going to be showing you guys YOLO, which is like a machine learning framework for um, getting computers to discern uh, different objects and pictures. So I'm going to go ahead and run that now. And this is also going to be over an SSH link.
Okay, so now it's running. So in order to see like what's going on uh, from that camera, you know, we can just come back here and darknet ROS uh, detections image pops up. So now we can see the, the camera, uh, the output image from the detector. Um, but it's not seeing anything right now because you know we don't have any, uh, any models there. So I'm gonna go ahead and insert uh, a model. Um, I'm actually gonna do it from, uh, from my desktop just cause uh, I haven't fully figured this out yet. I know that there's some, uh, some features on like how to add um, models. It doesn't have quite the, uh, the thumbnails and I've noted some, noticed some weird things about this, but I think they're fixable. So put a, I'm gonna put a SUV in the scene here. So yeah, now we've got the uh, the SUV there, and the uh, the neural network's been trained to recognize like a variety of different uh, objects, and one of them is a car. So as we fly around, we should be able to to see this car. So that's pretty cool. And uh, just like how we did before with um, uh, with the Mavros topics, like we can uh, we can also check check out the outputs from the darknet uh, topics on our Ross network. So let's go ahead and SSH into my computer again. Oops. So I can do a Ross. Uh, topic list, and uh, if I scroll up, I'll see these darknet um, topics. So if I want to see like the pixel positions of the bounding boxes, I can use the bounding box topic. So I can do a Ross um, Ross topic echo bounding boxes and. Uh, yeah, we can see we can see a bunch of information about the bounding boxes and uh, when the picture was taken, when the the picture was processed, and and stuff like that. What 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 it's detecting, like the the car. So that's pretty cool. Um, so finally, I kind of wanted to. I just wanted to do a demo. Actually, wait. Before I do the demo on the hiker, let's uh, let's show let's show how we can use a uh, ground station to connect to the vehicle. So I have a Q ground control here, and uh, basically what Q ground control is is it's a it's a GUI software to allow you to like control drones uh, from your computer. So what I've done is like I've come to the uh, comms link tab, and uh, I've like set up a connection to uh, my simulated drone. So if we go to edit, like I can show you the, the settings I have here. So I have a TCP connection, and I know that. Um, my SIM desktop IP address is 192.168.1.65. And I know that um, that my uh, RD pilot like simulation is outputting the Mavlink stream on uh, 8,100. So I'll just put that in there. And now I can just uh, go ahead and connect to that drone. So I have the position of my drone. And so instead of using Mav proxy, I can fly the drone, drone around uh, just like I was typing in the console and whatnot. And again, like you can come up here, come back here and you can see it flying around. You can see the car there. So that's pretty cool. All right, so last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reset this. I'm gonna have it return to home and then I'm gonna run the, uh, the hiker mission. So can you see the models from, uh gazebo in Q ground control? Like, can you uh, visualize that SUV in Q ground control? No, there's not. So uh, basically the way that you should think of uh, Q ground control is it's just an interface that's uh, that's directly connected to just the, uh, to RD pilot, the software that's running just on the PixHawk. So I guess this would be like useful for testing purposes. Yeah, it would also be useful um, 
Actually, I don't know how much. I actually haven't looked at the mission that you guys are trying to run. But if you guys are trying to upload like waypoint plans, like you can you can upload like waypoint plans and you can see its position in 3D space and get a lot of uh, debug information. Like on mission seven, uh, we used Mission Planner, which is a very similar software to, to Q Ground Control. And what we were using it for was basically uh, to see a lot of the uh, the state of the drone, right? Because if I come if I come up to the, the corner over here, I can see like the altitude, the the speed of it, and uh, I can augment that with like a bunch of other uh, data from the drone telemetry. So that's another use that you can use key ground control for. <clears throat> okay, so now let's do the hiker um, bits. So I have this program that I made in C++. Uh, it's, uh, it'll basically do like a little square wave of the drone. And then like once it finds the person, it's just gonna land. Um, I can, I don't really wanna get into uh, how to code it. So if you guys wanna see the software, I've done, I've done some YouTube tutorials on how to, how to actually like code this, but I kinda wanna show off like more the high level and like the capabilities and like how, how to run this, how it all works together. So yeah, I'm trying to find a uh, clean terminal here. So yeah, I have this uh, program called Search and Rescue, and it's the solution to my uh, to my YouTube tutorial. So that's the name, SR Soul. And uh, so I have a I have like a little bit of a programming API that um, I've developed I've developed over some time. And basically, what it was was these were the kind of like C plus plus functions that Umer and um, a bunch of other people on the team uh, when I was there had made, and I've kind of further further refined it a little bit and released it on my GitHub. And it's called the IQ GNC functions. And so it has a lot of high level functions for uh, navigation and uh, going to waypoints in the local coordinate system, um, changing the mode, arming the aircraft, uh, those kind of things. And basically what this program uh, is doing is it's using those functions and it's listening to um, the output of YOLO and uh, taking that information to then decide to land once we see the person. So let me go and insert the person. Person in. And then the way my functions work is they only work when you're in mode guided. So this is kind of this is kind of a safety feature because basically if you were ever to start losing control, you can switch the mode of the drone to uh, maybe like a manual mode and then take over via controller or switch it to like um, just a lower augmentation. And then the uh, the pro the the commands from the companion computer will no longer be affecting the the drone. So I. Like I said, you can go back to map proxy and just change the mode to guided. So now it's in guided and the uh, the program is like starting. So here in a second, it's just the aircraft uh, take off and start flying the mission. Oh no, it might have already saw a person <laughs> somehow. <laughs> Must have got a false detection. Dang it. <laughs> yeah, it says person detected. All right, we're going to try that again, but better this time. I'm going to remove the car just in case it gets confused by that for whatever reason. All right, go back. Set it to mode guided.
Yeah, so give it a sec. It, uh, it takes a second to go to this first waypoint. So yeah, it's continuing on and searching for the person. And uh, oh yeah, if you guys are wondering where the person is, I like put them in, but the reason why I did on my desktop is because like uh, there are like still some glitches that I haven't quite figured out with the GZ web uh, thing. So the person is actually um, here. It's actually here, like where this little box is and it's not showing it on the web version, but I think that's just a matter of getting, uh, of getting renderings, which I just haven't done yet. So the other thing is like, you can come to key ground control and you can kind of see the, uh, the direction that's going. So let me go move the person so that the drone can see it. <laughs> All right, so the person is just off to the right of the drone now. So here in a second, it should see it once it goes on to the next leg of the journey. Oh, it actually already saw it. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Just moved him over there. Well, that didn't quite go as perfectly as I planned, but you guys kind of get the high level concept um, so yeah, I guess now we'll just open it up to questions. So how did you tell, um, I guess what told the drone to land? Like it recognized a person. Is there like a Ross topic that tells it what object it's recognizing? And then you tell the drone to land when that topic is recognized. Yeah, it's actually the detection, um, the bounding box one. So if you if you subscribe to this topic, um, you can use oh. the the class, and then you just like do a little string, string compare for for person, and then that's what's just telling the drone to land. Cool. So for the mission this year, we're going to have to classify some kind of like that antenna. I guess a way that we've been thinking to do that is to train either Darknet or some neural network on what the antenna looks like, and we would do something similar. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. No. That. Uh, yeah. I think Darknet could be a could be a good use. Um, one of the things that Darknet struggles with is um, like small features. So like the antenna might be really thin, and you may not uh, get reliable detections until you get close to it. So maybe you can also augment that with uh, with like maybe some image processing. So maybe like. Maybe you could like do like an edge detector because you'll probably see like a lot of up and down kind of features and then maybe feed the output of that into YOLO or com combine like the edges with the, t the detection that you get from YOLO to like further build the confidence that that's your antenna or something like that. It made the antenna reasonably, uh, I don't want to say easy, but it's pretty large and I think they, they have like really unique color signatures on it. All right, good. So yeah. yeah. So then YOLO will probably be a, be a good option for that. And then when it comes to like uh, getting like a false detection on like a car or something like that, could you have, could you set some sort of uh, requirement such that you have to detect it so many times in order to, to go into the next phase of the mission? Yep. Yeah. Uh, there, so there, there are a lot of uh, ways to combat that. And uh, so what I'm, what I'm using right now are the generic weights that you get with YOLO. So um, one of the ways that you can combat that is with uh, is with good training of the neural network. And so this is this is kind of like a different discipline rather than programming. This is uh, this is like neural net training. It almost requires like different skills. So like a lot of the skills that you'll kind of need is like figuring out like what kind of data uh, do I need to like to get accurate um, detections of this uh, of this object. So like some of the things that you'll need is like 
um, you need diversity of your images. You need images that are close to the object, onto the left, to the top, far away, and uh, you need close to the same situations that you would be in. So, like one of the things that Yolo does is, is it realizes that um, typically, like when you see a car, it's like near a near a road. So if you have the same kind of backgrounds in the images, there's a there's a higher likely uh, higher there'll be higher confidence in the detections that you get. So one of the limitations of the sim is it's like it's like you do have like the same kind of uh, 3D pictures, but like you know this person doesn't look like a real person. And the grass doesn't look like real grass. So it's it's like good enough, but you get low confidence detections. So in the sim like with these weights, um, you get a lot of false detections. Yeah, that's that's a good point. And that's part of the justification for uh, for moving to something like AirSim because they have like extremely accurate shaders, really accurate grass roads, like people and, and everything is like, it almost it almost seems like it would be impossible to, to tell the difference for like a, a camera that's not really high resolution. Yeah, so I think AirSim is uh, extremely interesting, especially from a from a vision perspective. Um, yeah, I'd love to play around with that. It's just uh, some of the limitations of AirSim is uh, first of all, it's like it's really big and it also requires a lot of compute. So I think at one point I had installed AirSim on my desktop, and I, honestly, I didn't play around with it for too long. But I did notice that it, it wasn't even running like that well on my gaming machine. So it'll be really interesting to see uh, what you guys um, end up discovering about that. Yeah, I got like a basic uh, uh, drone flying in AirSim with a controller and I, I couldn't get a, I had it connected to Pilot, but I couldn't get like a GPS lock in AirSim. So oh, I couldn't, interesting. yeah, I couldn't, I could, so I could get the GPS lock just flying Pilot normally, but with AirSim it didn't work. So I'm kind of trying to figure that out right now, but either way, um, you can you can build like if you have the Unreal Editor, you can build your own like really basic, uh, really basic landscapes because a lot of the more complicated landscapes have like moving objects and like a ton of shaders and like very small, uh, very small objects and stuff like that. But I, I think yeah. if we made our own basic one with just like the mast or whatever that we're trying to train on, it would be more uh, more doable for like a gaming computer or something like that as opposed to like massive pre-built environments. We should yeah. also reach out to NTNU and ask them if they have like, they've built the mast like exactly with like the lighting and everything. So we should ask them if they could just send us their pictures of the mast. Yeah, if they'd be willing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I think that, I think that's a good route. Um, you know, if you want something uh, quick, you know, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of expertise in Gazebo. So you know, if you want. If you want something to fall back on, Gazebo is probably a, a fairly Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You've also kind of built like a very large sort of framework for just like running basic uh, missions, especially with like vision and stuff like that. So I don't know. It's it's kind of a trade-off between ease and then like being able to train something uh, very well beforehand before actually having to fly your, your drone. Yeah, and that being said, like you could still use other aspects uh, or a lot of the aspects that I showed you here today in right, AirSim. right. Like the only thing that you would be replacing is instead of okay, running Gazebo, you're running um, you're running AirSim, and then right. like you can still use you can still use like the web the web like vision or like visualizer or not not of Gazebo but of like the image streams, and uh, you use the same commands, same ROS uh, concepts and stuff like that. You can even even use like the same Q ground control connections. So. Right. Got uh, other questions? Oh, there are a lot more in chat, I think. I had not been looking at that. Ooh, a lot of positivity. Chat going crazy. <laughs> can we get uh can we get F's and chats, boy, boys and girls? <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Okay, so somebody asked, so we'll be able to run the team's desktops from our laptops. And yeah, that's basically what I was uh, what I was showing to you. But that was probably a long time ago. So that would have been, so that's a good question, yeah. Super cool. Ooh. 
<laughs> Any other questions? Just like ideas. I would also be interested in just like uh, hanging around just to like chat and like get to know people a little bit more too. I had a anonymous text message that said, just get the actual antenna models and purposely overtrain the neural net super hard. So you can yeah. do that. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I think that's a interesting, uh, that that's definitely something to try for sure. And like I said, you kind of do need, you kind of want to have images with the same kind of context around the, around the object. So like maybe synthetic images. So something to keep in mind when you do synthetic images for your training is to, is to kind of like, you know, put it, put the same kind of backgrounds that you'd be seeing the antenna on as well. Yeah. I mean, ideally we would take the antenna and go put it in a field and take a ton of pictures of it. Yeah. And, and NTNU actually, has that. And I would think if we asked them nicely, they would probably send us that. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, that's basically what we did with, uh, with the Roombas is like, we went out uh, with the same like uh, texture of the ground with the lines and everything. And we, we just took our phones and we just went click, 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 click. And that became the, uh, the, um, the data for our neural net. You have a question in chat. Oh yeah. Can you explain the separation between Darknet and YOLO? Like what each one does specifically? All right. So, you know, uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm 95% sure like this is what it is. So Darknet seems to be the, uh, the uh, machine learning like framework, right? So you can, so you can end up training other kinds of uh, neural nets with Darknet. Um, it's just YOLO is using Darknet to do the to do the training for the YOLO detector. So YOLO will basically take the weights, which is the output from Darknet, and then you use those. You load the weights into the YOLO detector when you're running uh, the application, and uh, those weights basically tell you um, it what what objects you're seeing. If that makes sense. So I actually had a question. When y'all were doing the Roomba thing, right, you don't have much variation in terms of your um, training data. You can find out like where the Roombas are and do the, so do you just use bounding boxes over time to track their movement? Because I remember that was a big thing. So how do you actually track their movement? Yeah, so we actually had a program and uh, I believe it's still on the TAR GitHub. It's called uh, Transformations Ross. And that's a, that's something that the computer vision team worked on, mostly Mark. And he figured out like, based off of the, uh, the field of view of the camera and like the focal length of the camera, um, if you have a detection at this, uh, at this point in the camera, the, uh, the Roomba is actually at uh, this position in 3D space. And the way that we were able to do that was focal length of the camera, the field of view, as well as the height of the drone. So we were taking the position data of the drone and then adding that into the equation. And, over time, we, we ended up building up a, an array of all these positions, and we ended up just doing a derivative over, over the array of the positions, and like that ended up getting you your velocity in the direction that it was going. And from there, then we could calculate where the, where the drone needed to be um, to perform the intercept. Okay, that makes sense. So when you have only the training data for the, um, like you're only looking at the Roombas, does it not start to see Roombas in things that aren't necessarily Roombas if you overtrain the image? Yeah, um, so we ended up pretty reliably, I, I think I was pretty, I was pretty happy with like um, how reliable like our detector, our detector ended up being. Um, so one of the things is like, make sure that you're getting kind of images with the same backgrounds and the same kind of and getting a variety in there. The other thing is like, um, 
you, you can kind of change the detection threshold. So, um, you know, you want to weed out like the low confidence ones. Um, but yeah, that is, that is something to consider. Um, yeah, if you were to train for other objects that will also be in your scene, um, you can then have kind of, you can have logic to be like, oh, if I'm seeing this detection and this detection at this position, then maybe like discard this or like wait one over the other or something like that. So one of the things we were talking about at another meeting was uh, like ignoring all the sensors and going fully navigation based on computer vision. Um, I think Umer said you guys were looking into that, but you ran into some major problems. So like what problems were those? Oh yeah. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't want to go fully vision based, but uh, you, you would want to end up, uh, you want to end up augmenting like your existing sensors with vision. And uh, I ended up getting, getting that working in the sim with orb slam and it seemed to work pretty well at least in the sim and basically what it was was it was still using the imu um and then i was taking the estimated position from orb slam and then using the mavros vision position estimate and then basically that topic allows you to give your own position estimates into the extending common filter which is running on rd pilot so then the extended common filter is fusing the IMU data with your vision estimates. And so you're getting a better estimate of where your position is. Well, this year, because we have those, that really nice GPS module, we probably could do it with only vision and GPS. Like just I, on I GPS just, alone, we can get to the antenna mass, no problem. Like it's in a fixed <laughs> position and we have centimeter accurate GPS. So the, the problem isn't getting to the mast. It's like, once you get there, like intercepting it is going to be the challenge. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you're shooting yourself in the foot if you start ignoring your IMU data because ultimately, oh, yeah, like, yeah. Uh, I don't, I think we just mean like optical flow and sonar and that kind of stuff are the sensors where we have in mind of like taking off of the drone. Mm. Well, okay. Yeah. And yeah, not like that. Yeah, yeah. I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I gotcha. Yeah. I was forgetting the, uh, the LIDAR. Yeah, you could probably get away with no LIDAR, for sure. And yeah, also the optical flow. If you end up having Orb Slam, I would probably be more confident in the Orb Slam position estimates than the optical flow one. That was pretty, uh, optical flow was jank, or, uh, just not very mature. Yeah, we're also open to getting some of those new Intel cameras that just came out, the those real senses. sense. There's new yeah, ones that came like out, and I haven't taken a look at them yet, but. Yeah, the ones with the IMU and the their, its own slam package, those look fantastic. I've never used them, but the first gen uh, were amazing. So I'm sure the second gen's even better by like a long yeah. shot. Yeah. So then you don't even need to play around with with orb slam and that kind of stuff. Then you just take the I'm pretty sure it has a ROS wrapper. You just take that and then pipe that into the uh, into the Mavros vision position estimate easy mode. <laughs> you guys are lucky. It's worth a try. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm pretty confident that, that would work. Other questions, ideas, concerns? I love talking about this stuff, so, you know, ask away. Why is the um, simulation like still counting? What exactly is it counting? Is it over time? Uh, yeah. So yeah, on the top, it's, it's giving you, it gives you a sequence. So yeah, it's like how many detections it's gotten on this topic. And then also it has, as a, uh, timestamp. And is that probability, the probability that it is a person? Yeah. So it's like 65% confident that it's a person. So yeah, if you were if you were to move the threshold above sixty five, then 
that um, that detection would no longer show. So in the case of this year's mission, that uh, mast assembly is going to be moving. It's going to be, have you kind of seen the video of it, Eric? I have not, actually. So it's like a six foot lighting scaffold that is on a, like a, a system that allows it to pivot in both directions in a sinusoidal motion. So it's going to be doing like, it's supposed to simulate like being on the ocean. Yeah. And so we have to figure out how we are going to not only understand that we are like in front of the antenna, but what position it's in because we have to intercept it, you know, in mm -hmm. some, some capacity, whether that's like grabbing onto it or just momentarily like touching it. So it, it, in, it won't be difficult to get like a bounding box on the antenna. Yeah. It's going to be difficult to figure out once we have that bounding box, where exactly is the antenna? Do you yeah. have any ideas like how we could do that? Cause I don't think like sonar or radar are going to work for something like that. Yeah. 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 So um, it depends on like what, what exactly you need to do to that antenna. I forget. So there's this like three foot long antenna on the mast and we'll be carrying an identical copy of that. And we have to remove the old one and place our copy on there. Mm -hmm. So our drone has to interact with this moving antenna, replace an antenna or this moving mast and take an old antenna off and put a new one on. Yeah. And so, so the, the idea we're working with now is to try to intercept it while it's in its upright position and attach a sub assembly of the drone onto the mast and then just take off with the drone. Yeah. Yeah, that seems that seems cool. So maybe maybe an idea that I have right now is um, you might want so in, instead of just training for the mass assembly at large, like maybe you start training for features on the mass as well. So maybe like the connection point that you're actually going to be interacting with, like that's another thing that you can train for. And maybe there's other features on the mass that that would be uh, useful useful points. And then you can kind of um, I guess, I guess the, you won't be able to use the same transformation that we did for mission seven because that assumed that everything was on a flat plane. Mm -hmm. So what you'll probably have to do is you probably have to use, I, I would probably use like stereo vision um, because then you'll, oh, yeah. you'll end up getting a depth map and from the detections from YOLO, you, you know where to look on that depth map. And then you just take the, the position of the bounding box and then get the, uh, get the depth um, of that region on the uh, depth map and then that would be the position of the uh of the feature right? okay so so maybe maybe so yeah you want to you want to detect multiple features like probably use stereo and then like combine all those into an algorithm that'll allow you to interact cool i actually saw on uh norway's instagram that they have a motor that faces like perpendicular to the other motors. So when they approach that antenna, I, I think they haven't shown any videos, but they're going to like apply full throttle to that motor that's sticking out to the side. So they can kind of like press onto that at mast assembly while they're swapping oh. out the antennas. And it has like a propeller on it. Yeah. It's basically just a giant propeller, like out it's of like the back pusher, of their drone. Pusher propeller or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's because the antenna, like it's just moving randomly. And so you have to like either intercept it and hold on while you swap those antennas. Or you have yeah. to like drop something off that does that. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, maybe maybe you can like force the uh, the antenna to like stay in position. Yeah, what we wanted Sweet. to do is like hook onto it, but it'd be really difficult to do because our drone is so large. The center of mass is like 15 inches away from the edge of the propellers, so we'd have to have something that extended out really far to be able to like grab onto that mast assembly. So yeah. that's why we kind of want just want something that we can like fly up quickly, hook on, and just let go. Yeah. Yeah, we have a long way to go on that, but it's it's certainly a cool problem. Yeah. Well, I mean the the first thing to do is like you probably once you get that uh going, you probably wanna figure or like fly it manually and like figure out how hard that is to do manually and then kinda hard. it's gonna be really hard. Figure out the techniques that allow you to do it manually and then like whatever techniques like you decide make it easy to like do it manually, then like code those. Yeah, we were getting ready to build like a crude version of the uh, mast assembly. 
it's like all the really? parts end up being pretty oh, expensive great. to build the real thing. Like we wanted to build it out of like PVC pipe and plywood. Gotcha. A basic one. Gotcha. Yeah. Instead of using bounding boxes, um, have you heard of pose estimation with like humans and stuff uh, with computer vision? I have. So, I have. I've never actually played around with it. Uh, in I mean, it's kind of just like a basic idea, but if you were to do the, it's basically a rectangle, right? So if you took the positions of the top two points and the bottom two points, whenever it's leaning towards you, you'll get like a trapezoidal shape. So based on the uh, difference between the length of the top and the bottom, you can kind of figure out what angle it's at. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, uh, sideways angle would also be based on, uh, so I guess if one's vertical and one's going to be more angle. So I... Uh, I don't know how we could translate like the shape of the trapezoid that you get into two angles. So um, there's probably some math to it, but I can't think of that. That might be something we look into. Yeah. The other thing you could do is um, maybe, maybe use YOLO um, and then you use the output of YOLO in like some image processing. Like maybe you do some like edge detection to like try to get like the line features and that, and basically you just use YOLO to kind of get to um, bound like where you're running your algorithm on. Yeah, and the features on the antenna mast are different colors. The box, there's like a, I think it's a 12 inch square blue metal plate that holds the antenna on it. And then there's the giant silver assembly. So we could filter out those separate parts of the image by color pretty easily. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you could, and like, uh, yeah, that'd be really interesting. Like, we we used uh, we we like played around with like color thresholding with the Roombas, um, and like uh, we 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 ended up noticing that we we're getting like a lot of false detections, especially from like the reflectivity of like the ground. So having, so probably combining YOLO with the color detection would probably be. Might, might be a good good option because then you can be like, oh, if I'm getting a green detection like way off off to the side, then you can discard that because like that's not in the region of interest. Also, somebody asked, is that just using a general pre-trained model for YOLO? And yeah, this is just the, the default trained YOLO model that you get when you download it off the GitHub. Oh, also, here let me let me show you this other uh, this other package that might be helpful for you guys. So there's this thing called the Coco annotator. It's this one. So if you guys come to this GitHub, uh, basically what this is is it's an annotator, but it's web based. So maybe you guys could set up this uh, on like one of your machines. And so then uh, basically all your data will be stored on your, on your server, which is hosting this website. And then everybody, anybody can create an account and then log in and like do portions of the annotation. Um, because one of the things that we noticed when we were doing the YOLO training is that, you know, we, we ended up having thousands of images and it was a pretty, it was a pretty tedious process. And uh, it, it is nice to be able to divvy it up. But the problem that we were having was that like, uh, it would take a long time to like copy onto a flash drive, put it on copy from the flash drive to the other person's computer. And then like they would get bored. And so I thought this was pretty cool. Cause like you can just log in, do training when you want, log out and everything's handled for you. Okie dokie. Well, uh, if there's no more questions, then the, uh, maybe we can just hang out. <laughs>